Uh, Jamie asks, have you had a chance to try Apple's new VR headset? Yes, I did get one a few days ago. And uh, yes, I've had a chance to try it. It's pretty cool. It's, uh, you know, there's a, a lot of hardware problems that I think have been rather nicely solved and a lot of user experience that's, uh, I think, been, again, rather nicely solved. It's not completely free of bugs, but particularly in interacting with um, non-Apple stuff. But um, so far, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. You know, I think that the... Uh, I've thought over the course of the last, I don't know, I first used virtual reality systems back at the beginning of the 1990s. So um, what is that? 30-something years ago. And uh, they were very clunky. This is, you know, finally this has sort of smoothed things out. I think it's fair to say that it is getting close to what happened with audio in the 1990s. When, in Before that time, if you were actually there at a concert or something like this, the audio was very different from whatever you could possibly get as a remote thing just with headphones and so on. And then digital audio came in and it started to be the case that it you could get sort of audio that was as good as being there. With video, that's not been the case until pretty much now. I mean, the this new Apple headset thing is pretty close to having sort of video that's as good as being there. You know, you can kind of tell because in its generic mode, you just put it on, you'll see the environment that you were in, but you're not really seeing it, like you're not seeing it with the same photons that came from the actual objects in the room. You're seeing cameras on the headset looking at what's there and sending you a... Uh, uh, and having the display inside the headset show what you would see if you were just if you took the headset off and were just looking at things, and it's it's high enough resolution that you know you can read your phone through the headset, so to speak, uh, with um, in that kind of virtual way. So that's and I, I really think we're we're pretty close to the point where it's you know video that's as good as as if you were there type thing. Uh, which is pretty interesting. And I think the thing that, to me, it's kind of like, well, you bring up a window, and there are these windows that float in front of you, and there's nice UX associated with how you pick up a window and move it around, how you can move it closer to you, further away, how you can resize it, how you can just put it somewhere in the room, and then you walk around the room, the window will stay in a fixed place, like a physical object that you put there, except it's just uh, in this kind of virtual space. And then in terms of, well, uh, you know, I have to say I have not yet done things that involve typing seriously while I'm looking at windows in the virtual space. Uh, you know, doing things like browsing the web and so on, it works pretty well. It's, you know, high resolution and so on. And, and what's kind of interesting is you can make these sort of giant windows in your visual, in your visual field and you can put them all over the place. So you know this this metaphor of the desktop that uh, one has with with ordinary windows, which I have to say, when I first saw that metaphor, with of putting you know windows on on a screen that were reminiscent of sort of pieces of paper on a on a desk, I was like, really, you're going to have a, something as messy as your desk on your computer? And I have to say, when I first saw this, which must have been 1979, I think, at uh, Xerox. Uh, seeing the their very original window system that had been built, um, you know, I was like, you know, there are all kinds of awkward things that happen if you put one window on top of the other. You can't get at the one that's underneath, and how are you going to deal with that? And I have to say that when I use window systems, which I do as everybody does all the time, you know, I, I always remember that, you know, when I'm like, oh, I want to get to this thing, but it's behind this, and I'm trying to move this file from here to there, and I can't do that because the thing is obscured. I sort of remember. That moment when I first saw this this kind of thing back in 1979 or so, where it's like, yes, this is going to be awkward, you know, as it is awkward on pieces of paper on a desk, so it is awkward on on what you see there. But now we've got sort of a, a yet new paradigm for this kind of 3D uh, sort of windows in space type thing, and uh, I have to say I haven't yet had the experience of dealing with a kind of highly multi-window environment. And a thing where one's sort of really 
uh, you know, where I'm trying to do a complicated piece of work and I've got 15 windows open and they're all in different places around the room and so on. I haven't yet had that experience. I think when you look at sort of 3D imagery and uh, we've got some nice things coming with Wealth and Language with a format that one can use to put things into, into VR, uh, it's uh, so far I haven't had a chance to study my own kind of scientific interests in sort of VR, 3D, but just looking at some other kinds of things, it's certainly very compelling. It's very, you know, you, you really feel like you're there. Now the question is, well, it's something where you really care about going down that little passageway in this complicated graph structure or whatever it is, you know, is that something where it's going to be useful? Is it something where you're going to get sort of the right feeling about what's going on? I will say hardware-wise, one of the things over the years I have been interested in doing is kind of using VR to explore kind of network models of space-time and so on. Actually, back when I first was was sort of uh, paying attention to VR, I'm first exposed to it back at the beginning of the 1990s, also was the time when I was first beginning to think about uh, sort of network models of space-time. And uh, I have to say, at that time, I sort of imagined, oh, I'm going to explore these network models of space-time by having a VR system and this giant, you know, exist in a giant spider web, and be able, I even had this, you know, was imagining at the time that you would see the places where there was activity in the network and it would be kind of glowing and you could pick up pieces of the spider web with your fingers and move them around and so on. And in all the years since then, and it's been, what, uh, 30, 35 years now, uh, no, a little, little, yeah, a little, little less than that. Um, the, uh, yeah, close to that, actually, uh, 30, 33 years, let's say, that um, the, uh, uh you know, I've, I've continued to think, well, this might be useful. And I did try about three or four years ago, I tried some experiments in VR with uh, sort of hypergraph free writing in our physics project and models of space time and so on. I didn't find them terribly useful or compelling. And uh, within with the systems that existed at that time, it was, you know, five minutes to motion sickness, so to speak, for me. I didn't find that with the Apple system. Uh, so I'm impressed by that. I think the frame rates are higher. And the uh, way of tracking head motion and so on is better. And I, I, I didn't get motion sick, you know, using it for a couple of hours. So that's one thing. Another thing I found interesting is there's kind of this notion of you can have a background. You know, it's kind of like, not like a, a, a screen background. It's a fully around you background. You can kind of set it so it's a 360 degree background. And they only have a few available yet. But, you know, they're nice natural scenes. And I have to say that I found it surprisingly, compellingly relaxing, so to speak, to be sort of reading my windows, so to speak, in this natural scene with uh, sort of wind rustling and trees and so on. The trees weren't moving, but uh, at least in one of them, there's, there's you know, ripples on, on a pond that's moving and so on. Um, it, I was surprised that that makes a difference. I mean, it, it felt like one sort of had the the peacefulness of being out in nature, even though it's a purely virtual thing. Actually, one of the environments that they have is the moon. And uh, uh, I sort of found that interesting because I you know, looked at pictures of the surface of the moon for, forever. Um, but actually looking at this, I realized, I assume that it's, a, uh, you know, it's an actual picture, so it's accurate. Um, it kind of doesn't look exactly as I had expected because it's kind of like there are these craters, but they they look like they've been eroded. They have been eroded in a sense by the solar wind, the stream of charged particles that comes from the sun. And over the last billion years or something, because not a lot changes on the moon, it's not like the earth where the atmosphere and the wind and so on are continually picking things up and raining on things and all those kinds of things. On the moon, you put a footprint there, it's still going to be there a billion years later. Although what's clear is that the solar wind which is not a wind in the sense of uh, a stream of air particles or something. It's a, it's a stream of, of protons and electrons coming from the sun um, that, uh, that that causes sort of gradual uh, kind of um, uh, smoothing out of the lunar surface, and you can kind of see that. Also notable is that kind of on the lunar surface, there are like, there's little details. It's not like, oh, it's just flat and... There are occasional craters there. 
know there are actually lots of little details. I don't entirely know what those are caused by. Um, and, you know, possibly the little detail has been there for a billion years. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, and, you know, when the moon was formed, it, uh, well, the moon probably was formed in this kind of big splat of an asteroid-like object hitting the Earth, liquefying most of the Earth. One piece of it ended up in the moon, and the other piece of it sort of ended up reforming to the Earth. And uh, presumably when that happened, gravitational forces made the moon roughly be spherical, and it, and it has kind of a lump on one side, uh, at least gravitational lump, even though the shape, as one can see plainly by looking up in the sky, is it's it's pretty spherical. But um, the you know the details of the surface, the fact that gravity in general makes the thing be spherical, the details at the level of individual mountains or at the level of individual kind of a uh, few millimeter or a few centimeter sort of uh, um, uh, kind of details on the surface. Um, is is not determined by gravity, and it's presumably determined by something about the solidification process for the rock um, that uh, that's developed there. Okay, anyway, that was that was irrelevant to the um, uh, the VR headset story, but um, you know the other thing about it is I was actually just doing a uh, Zoom call in which I was um, uh, in the headset, so to speak. And although there were some bugs around um, how, exactly how that worked, uh, people were able to see the the avatar of me, uh, which the headset kind of captures, and you know it it asks one in its setup to uh, to take a picture of yourself and to take a picture of yourself with various different expressions, and then what it's doing is it's looking at your eyes because it can see your eyes. It has cameras look, watching your eyes, and uh, um, then it's synthesizing what you would look like, so to speak, given that kind of eye motion. And it looked a bit weird. Uh, I, I will say one thing, this very basic thing that I wondered about for a long time about, about VR is what the right way to click on something is. And I have to say that I would say it works really nicely with this system because literally you look at something and it has good enough eye tracking, it can really see with quite high resolution what you're looking at and then you just touch your fingers like this and that's a selection. And it really works nicely. Um, and also the kind of the hover effect of a user experience type thing, when you look at something, it can kind of blob around and show you, yes, this is what you're looking at type thing. And for example, how do you get to the home screen? Well, you just sort of look up and this little arrow shows up and you can, you can kind of select it and uh, and then that gets you to a home screen where you can navigate and go to go to other kinds of things. So it's uh, uh, what will I use it for? Well, I'm going to try using it as a way to actually do work rather than having a bunch of physical big screens have these virtual screens. It's a very nice bright display, um, and uh, I think it'll be something where, for example, if one's kind of out and about, and one's sitting on a, you know, plain, I don't know, coffee shop, whatever, and one couldn't unfurl one's whole collection of monitors and so on, you got this thing on, and uh, uh, then you can at least virtually see a whole arrangement of giant screens at high resolution, and so that's potentially something that I think will be useful. Uh, this whole thing about sort of are you inside the object and walking around and so on, I don't know how that's going to feel um, uh, in, in the system. Uh, I also don't really know the kind of pass-through video is good enough that certainly one could imagine sort of doing some manual thing with one's, with one's hands um, and sort of seeing what one's doing but with augmented information. Um, I haven't seen that working yet, uh, but that's a thing that one could um, uh, one could certainly imagine, and that might be interesting. I mean, it's kind of like, oh, you want to uh, tie a knot. I, I can completely believe that you can see your hands. You've got a piece of rope or whatever. You can see your hands, but it's being you know it's being annotated, um, or a whole variety of manual tasks like that, where it's kind of like the the machine is treating us humans with our fingers and so on as 
you know, kind of you're the robot, the machine is in charge, and it's telling you put this finger in this place and that finger in that place, and it's really doing that in a very explicit way with augmented reality because you're kind of almost seeing your hands, but you're seeing your hands with those extra indications of, of what you should do and so on. I would say that the thing, as I say, typing, uh, I think it's perfectly possible to use an external computer with its keyboard and so on, and to type on that. There's a virtual keyboard you can get up. I, I, I'm certainly not a fast typer on these virtual keyboards. Maybe one could learn to be a faster typer, and maybe the right way to use them is that these are virtual keyboards that are coming up in, in, in virtual reality. And when you type on them, you're putting your finger uh, you know, you're poking through the air, so to speak, to type on them. And it may be that it's a better experience if you actually have a physical surface there and you're just tapping your fingers as you would on a, a regular keyboard. It might be that that's a, a more uh, kind of, uh, at least a more familiar experience. Maybe one can get used to the other one. But um, so a, a few thoughts about that, um, uh, that system. 